Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us again. I want to remind um, everyone who's attending that this meeting is being recorded. I also want to remind everyone that given the uh, unprecedented circumstances uh, resulting from the pandemic that we are utilizing the benefit of relief that the governor granted through his order, um, relieving us from certain obligations under provisions of the open meeting law. Um, this meeting will therefore be recorded using collaborative virtual uh, technology. If there's any trouble with our technology, please go to our website at massgaming.com and we'll give uh, uh, guidance there as to how we can connect in this virtual setting. So thank you everyone and, and good morning. Uh, I am convening today's meeting. It's Massachusetts Gaming Commission's 301st meeting. Today is Thursday, May 7th and it is 10.02 a.m. We thank you. Uh, my remarks this morning are simply that we are thinking of everyone who's working on the front line, particularly our nurses in celebration of uh, the National Nurses Week. Um, we have a nurse in our family. I'm thinking of her as she's participating in the contact tracing program. I know that many of us have nurses in our lives and we know exactly how um, important their roles are each day and particularly at this time. So thank you. We have a busy schedule, um, a long meeting, testament to all the work of the team here um, as we continue to be open for business. Thank you. I'm uh, going to turn it over right to our, um, our minutes and Commissioner Stebbins, please. Good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Thank you and our MGC team. Uh, first uh, set of minutes is from the April 23rd, 2020 meeting. Uh, I, those were included in your packet. I would move their approval subject to corrections for any typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Second. Are there any questions, edits? Hearing none, I'll have a roll call vote. Oh, and I'm sorry, I should have established the, the quorum, which I could see visually, but um, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner um, O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. I vote aye, five zero, Shara, and we of course hear, now everyone can hear, we do have a quorum. Thank you. Moving on to item number two. Uh, sure, Madam Chair, oh, the sorry. next, that's okay. No, the, the, the next set of minutes are from the uh, April 29th, 2020 meeting. I would also move their approval subject to corrections for any typographical errors or any other non-material changes. I, I don't think they were included in the packet, were they? No. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think those will come in our next our next meeting. The twenty uh, um, they were on our agenda, but I believe there was a little bit of a technical glitch. Yeah, oh, yeah. challenge twenty third today. You're we'll correct. Have, Sorry we'll about have that. Several in the nope. packet next week. No, nope, no problem. We will. I think we will attend to the minutes of April 29th and May 1st at our, our next meeting if the uh, technology, um, it was, it's not in any way a reflection of our IT department, it's just a, uh, a reflection of maybe a, a tired laptop. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll attend to those minutes in, in our next meeting. So I'll withdraw if, that motion then. Okay, thank you so much. And we'll continue then on to item number two. Interim Executive Director Karen Wells, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. Uh, as an update, uh, the staff continues to effectively work remotely. That continues to go well. As we have previously discussed, we are gearing up for the eventual reopening of the casinos. We are focusing not only on normal operational regulatory requirements, but also the enhanced public health requirements, uh, which are going to be necessary uh, given the situation that we're all facing right now. So noteworthy for the commission are the following four points which I wanted to bring to your attention today. Uh, number one, aside from the ongoing staff work, uh, the reopening working group that the chair referenced at the last meeting has con convened and that process is ongoing. Uh, number two is that the licensees have been asked to submit specific reopening plans, and we expect to have those shortly as, uh, as soon as tomorrow. 
Uh, number three, we will have a commission meeting next week to review those plans with the licensee. So we will continue that cadence of uh, working on the reopening process in that way. And also number four, we continue to monitor information and the mandates from the governor's office, including any information regarding, uh, pardon me, resulting from the state's reopening advisory board. So we continue to monitor everything that's going on. Uh, the staff is doing a lot of work internally on all of those um, uh, processes and procedures, and we will be giving updates to the commission at a regular basis so that uh, when the casinos are ready to open, we will be ready to go. So I don't know if the commission has any questions on that, but that is generally the outline of what's going on right now. So uh, and is there any questions from any of the commissioners on that? Um, I thought, I think I see Enrique. Um, I was just gonna ask, I, my understanding they was gonna, the licenses were gonna get those plans to us by close of business tomorrow. Is that not the I, date? So? I think so. So we'll, we'll confirm, but that was, that was what the ask was, that they'd be given to us tomorrow. If there's any kind of uh, on their end, I'll let, I'll update you. But that had been the request from our staff. Okay, thank you. Yep, Commissioner Zuniga. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I look forward. Uh, like uh, like I know the rest of us um, look forward to those examining those plans and discussing them. Um, there is uh, there's there's a lot of planning that needs to um, that apparently needs to go into into this. I was uh, remembering. Um, that is essentially a question I look forward to discussing. But um, early, early on in our tenure, uh, there was a question that came to us that was never really addressed uh, because we moved on relative to the potential of having gaming, notably slot machines, uh, in the outside, you know, with proper uh, proper coverage uh, of uh, of uh, you know for for inclement weather, but also for uh, uh, security and the like. That was done in the context of whether there could be smoking at, right. um, at the facility uh, and be able to um, still comply with the uh, aspect of the statute that has a non-smoking indoors provision. And uh, again, that was never really executed. It was simply a question of feasibility that would have required uh, a capital expenditure, of course. Um, but it's something that I am now curious that uh, as I see other industries uh, considering uh, that perhaps a, an outside activity is more feasible, uh, restaurants thinking about opening their decks first as opposed to you know, the indoors. I'm just curious if that's something that um, the licensees will entertain or are planning on or 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 if it's too expensive to do it would defeat the purpose but uh i look forward again to um to those discussions and um and i'm glad that people are working on okay thank you um commissioner Chairman? wells i i had a quick uh, thought also and and this is uh for uh director lightbaum as well um, at some point, we should be considering our license, uh, our racing licensee, and national, and uh, a plan that they may be contemplating. They obviously have several racetracks uh, around the country, so I'm sure they have been thinking about plans to open safely. So I'd be interested in seeing a plan uh, at some point um, from our license, uh, our racing licensee. Yeah, and. Uh Dr. Lightbaum has been on top of that and has been monitoring what's going on, uh, not only across the country, but is expecting a plan on the, the racing part. So that would be part of uh, National's PPC license plan. Great. That would include racing as well. Thank you. Okay. And, and I appreciate particularly, um, I wanna comment that we did convene the um, Restart Working Group and that's, quite a small group, but again, we're so appreciative of the expertise that we have internally here. You know, we do have the experience of Bruce Band and team who have actually engaged in reopening under different circumstances, but still trying circumstances in New Jersey with, with Sandy. And I also um, truly appreciate um, that uh, Karen has 
has referenced that we will be looking you know, to the uh, reopening advisory board from the governor's office as they issue public health guidelines, which will inform our work. And of course, we'll be um, looking at the, the May 18th deadline. So we um, continue to operate really in sync with that work and we'll, we'll be, you know, no doubt given some good, good guidance and, and um, we'll be monitoring it. So thank you. Thank you. Any other comments by the commissioners? None. Uh, at this point, I'd also like to ask uh, Joe Delaney uh, to give the commission just an update on some things that are going on in Springfield. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to give you a little quick update on the 31 Elm Street project uh, out in Springfield. Um, if you all remember back on February 27th, uh, we met out in Springfield and that's not that long ago, but sometimes feels like a lifetime ago. Uh, but um, so out there, the commission approved the approach that the city and MGM and the developer were taking on the redevelopment of 31 Elm Street. And, uh, you know, of course, for our purposes, uh, that was to ensure that the project would satisfy MGM's commitment to construct market rate housing. Um, now, just the other day, there was an article in Mass Live that was talking about a project and a certain approval that was made by the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, just by way of background a little bit, uh, Quartz Square, which includes the 31 Elm Street project, is uh, an urban renewal district and is being redeveloped under the auspices of the urban renewal laws. Um, so in order to transfer the 31 Elm Street property from the city, who was the current owner, to the developer, uh, DHCD needed to approve the disposition of that property, which is the approval that was recent, recently made and, and referenced in that Mass Live article. So really, um, what's happening now, this is just another step in the process. Um, you know, a good step forward, certainly, but, um, you know, there's still a ways to go before construction can begin. Uh, but, you know, it's really great to see the city and the developer um, still moving forward on the project, considering the current circumstances with COVID-19 and all, um, you know, the fact that they're able to move forward is a great, uh, a great testament to that, to that team. So I've talked with the city and, um, you know, they're certainly encouraged by uh, this development. Uh, and, you know, this approval from DHCD and the fact that, you know, things are still moving forward. Um, you know, COVID-19 obviously has uh, probably uh, affected the construction schedule and all. We don't really have a, a good firm construction schedule yet. But uh, once we get that, you know, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna i continue to monitor the status of the project and I'll report back to the commission, um, you know, as new information arises and we get uh, a few more details regarding the actual uh, start of construction. Any questions for uh, Joe? Very helpful. And, and forward thinking, which uh, we welcome. Any questions, Bruce? Uh, yeah. Um, this, is, this is just prospective as you, uh, uh, as, as you look to continue monitoring, uh, Joe. Uh, and I don't know the answer to this, and I don't think we'll know it, but uh, it's something to consider. My recollection is that this uh, project relied on um, tax credits, historic uh, tax credits and the like. Um, and it's not clear that, um, I, and I just wonder how that, be, that may be affected given the recent, um, uh, you know, given all the recent economic conditions. Um, there may still be a, 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 credit, a market for those credits, um, but it's, uh, it's important to continue thinking about what may happen or what might develop from uh, given the current economic uh, conditions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think that's something that, you know, I could talk with DHCD about and, and some of the other entities. Um, but, you know, obviously this approval that they gave uh, gives a certain indication that, you know, things are moving forward apace. They wouldn't allow it unless the financing package was in place and so on and so forth. So. Uh, right now, we think everything's good, but I'll certainly look into that. Thank you. Any other, any other questions for Joe? Thank you for that update. <clears throat> so that, that's all I have for, for this meeting today. So I'll just uh, uh, turn it over to you for the next agenda item, Madam Chair.
Great, we're moving now on to item number four, Re research and responsible gaming. Mark, um, I, I don't see you yet. There you are on the screen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning Madam Chair and Commissioners. Thank you, and uh, you, you do have guests today. If you could introduce them. I understand uh, that uh, Professor Bruce will not be joining us visually, but we will be able to hear him clearly. Right, and he should be able to kind of pick up and, and show some slides um, after this introduction. Thanks. Um, Madam Chair and Commissioners, I'm uh, excited to present to you today um, the, the first follow-up report, um, looking at, taking a look at the public safety impacts um, of Encore Boston Harbor on Everett and the surrounding area. Um, I'm joined by um, Professor Christopher Bruce, who has been a longtime crime, crime analyst, uh, helping us look at, at um, impacts in Plainville and Springfield. Um, I'm also joined, I don't see him, there's, there's a lot of people joining, uh, but I believe that we have um, the Everett Police Chief um, Maisie uh, on, the, on the call. So if um, following the presentation, you have questions specifically for him, as well as um, Lieutenant Brian Connors. So uh, both of them should be available should we have questions following. Um, before I start, I really uh, want to thank um, uh, Commissioners uh, Cameron and O'Brien for their assistance in, in um, this report. They both have extensive expertise that lend very well to, to this, um, as well as uh, um, all of the, the police chiefs and crime analysts and um, our host and surrounding communities who um, have taken this incredibly seriously. Um, if there are crime impacts, if there are public safety impacts, they absolutely want to know what they are. Um, and, uh, and a joined effort to be able to address it, to be able to, to mitigate that. Um, the report that, that uh, Christopher will present to you shortly um, builds on a baseline uh, report, taking a look at what was happening in the host and surrounding communities for five to seven years prior to the opening of, of Encore Boston Harbor. Um, one of the things that I really appreciate um, about the work that Christopher does is that it carefully considers the context. And what I mean by that is, um, what were the crime? What are the crime trends um, currently in in the host and surrounding communities, as well as as statewide? Are they going up, down? Are they stable? Um, it considers the historical data. It considers the ba the baseline and comparing it to that. Um, it looks at the use of the the space prior to the opening of the casino or prior to construction of the casino. Um, it also considers crime rates at similar size facilities. Um, while um, cri crime um, was certainly reported at Encore Boston Harbor, I think it's important to understand what that really means as you take, as you compare it to other similar types of facilities, which is hard because Plain Ridge Park, or, uh, because Encore Boston Harbor had um, roughly six, three million visitors in the first six months. So, um, I'm excited for uh, you to hear more about, about this report. Um, before I turn it over to Christopher, the one thing that I, I, uh, I do want to mention is um, we're doing this as, as part of our, our statutory mandate. Um, we have an incredibly robust research agenda, um, taking a look at what are the social and economic impacts of, of casino gambling in the state across a variety of different topics. Um, this, is, this is a research agenda that's unlike any other part of the United States. Um, it's, a, it's a tribute and a credit to the need to be data-driven. Um, it's a credit to the, the legislature for recognizing that we needed to, to take, take this type of approach. Um, and key and explicit within that statute um, as we're looking at social and economic impacts, is a, a specific call out to look at the relationship between crime and gambling. I think that this is, this is what the legislature intended. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Bruce. 
Christopher, are you? Are yeah, you I can. Thank you, Mark. Um, I think somebody has to pass me the presenter view or something, though, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, I, I guess I would be the one responsible for that. Actually, uh, Madam Chair, this is Katrina. Can you do that? Bruce, all you need to do is hover your mouse to the bottom of the screen where the menu options are, oh. and you click on share, and you can share your presentation. Oh, my apologies. I thought Excellent. differently. Okay. Thank you, uh, Katrina. As always, vigilant and uh, very timely. Thank you. There we I go. I assume you're now seeing the title slide? We are. Thank oh, you. excellent. Okay. Well, um, the agencies participating in the report uh, have not changed, unfortunately, since the uh, the baseline that I presented to you. I, I don't remember when, in the fall, I guess. Um, so uh, Lynn, Melrose, Malden, Revere, Everett, Somerville, uh, Boston, and uh, Chelsea all contributed data to this report. Um, Medford expressed interest, and I don't know precisely why uh, I was never unable to, to get a, an actual commitment from them, uh, and Cambridge declined uh, to participate entirely. I made contact with the uh, MBTA police, but uh, was unable to get their data in time for the report. And the, we'll, we'll keep trying to enlist these other agencies as we go along. But of course, it's most important to have the host agency's cooperation. And as Mark indicated, um, they, they have a very uh, good crime analysis unit there, and, and the chief has been very cooperative, and um, it, it's been a very f uh, fluid and flexible relationship with the agencies immediately surrounding uh, Encore Boston Harbor. So a summary of what happened in the first six months, and I, and I do want to stress it's just six months. There isn't a whole lot you can tell from just half a year's worth of data, but it, it was, uh, the, the casino itself was the site of 124 arrests and 506 evictions or ejections during the first six months. Um, because of crimes that happened literally at the casino, uh, that led to a 9.5% increase in violent crime, a 5.1% increase in property crime, and a 6% increase in total crimes for the city of Everett. So th that's only stuff that happened at that particular address. Um, overall crime totals for Everett and for the region were mostly within expected ranges. We're going to see the exceptions to that in just a bit. Uh, some individual crimes did increase, but rarely in a way that could be traced to uh, Encore Boston Harbor, although I do want to emphasize that, again, this just being six months, I didn't, um, I didn't dig as deeply as I will when I have more data to, uh, to work with. Um, the only real increase that, that could be definitively traced to Encore Boston Harbor had to do with traffic complaints in the neighborhoods east, and I, I should, I guess, have added north of the casino, which I'll show you on a map in, in just a bit. Um, and I, I just want to emphasize, I know you've seen these a thousand times before from me, but uh, the basis of my work is to create an expected uh, range of values that you would ex we would expect each crime to fall into based on historical averages or historical trends. And there are a couple of ways of doing it, depending on whether the data has shown a trend over time. Uh, there's one met uh, statistical method that, that looks at averages and the deviation from the average and projects a window of what you'd expect in, in, in this case in 2019 based on those historical averages. There's, uh, there are other methods that, that don't work well with, with, with that calculation if there's a trend. And so we have to use a different method if there's been a historical trend to predict the window. So uh, the, the report goes into that in more detail, but basically I used one method when there was a trend and, and one method when there wasn't. This created some interesting results in a couple of cases. For instance, take uh, into consideration burglary here, which in the region had been falling quite rapidly over time. You can see that they were at about 1,100 in 2012, and in 2018, they were down to 400. I mean, that's an incredible decrease for the region, and it's not unique to burglary. A lot of crimes in the Chelsea, Everett, Revere area had been going down significantly over the past seven years before the casino was opened. So if 
Encore Boston Harbor or any other factor caused that trend to reverse or flatten out, you'd want to know that. I mean, it, it's, it's still important information. But you run into the oddity that we see here where even though, so 2019 on, on this chart, you can't quite tell, but it's a little bit lower than 2018. So the 2019 figure, the post Encore Boston Harbor figure for burglary for the region was the lowest that it had been in the past uh, at least seven years or eight years that you can see on this chart. Uh, but obviously, you know, it, it had been higher uh, even before 2012. Probably that 2019 figure, just from what I know about crime statistics for the region, is the lowest that it's been in, in half a century. And yet, because my uh, forecasting model predicted a lower <laughs> rate, uh, it showed up, it was flagged by, by the statistical process as being unusually high, if that makes sense. So you can see the trend line here indicating where, where, the date, where it was going, basically, and it didn't go there. It flattened out, and so my, uh, the report says that burglary was higher than expected for the region. And that, that, that's true mathematically, but that's an, it's, it's one of those cases where you have to you know, put an asterisk there. And, I, of course, I wrote this in the report, that even though – it out it outperformed what we would have expected based on the predicted value. It was still lower than uh, than any other year uh, for a long time, and therefore we don't need to get too worked up about that uh, uh, that increase. Now, if that flattening out continues, though, uh, over time we have to ask the question: Was it caused by something, or was it did it just reach a floor that it would have reached anyway? Uh, irrespective of whether a casino or anything else happened to the community. But I, I just wanted to point out there are a couple of statistical oddities like that. Thefts from vehicles are very much the same in the region, uh, simply because they were having such a decrease in crime before uh, the casino was even introduced into the equation. That said, here are some uh, statistics for Everett specifically. Uh, in, th these are the ones that, that increased uh, high, they were higher than, than expected for the period uh, post-casino. Uh, these statistics are for just the period of July 1st through December 31st. And, uh, and some violent crimes increased in Everett during that period. Murder, sexual assault, and aggravated assault, as well as a couple of property crimes, thefts from buildings, and fraud. And then uh, on the, the societal crime side, disorderly conduct and drunk driving. Now the totals were generally within the expected range except for violent crime, but property crime and total crime and, and collisions were all within the expected range, but those crimes did see an increase. And so uh, I've been working with the, the average crime analyst to help explain uh, those increases. We, you know, obviously even if nothing had changed in the city, some crimes would have been up, some crimes would have been down. We couldn't really find any particular evidence of, a, of an Encore Boston Harbor uh, influence on any of those crimes. So looking at individual cases, looking at where the crimes were occurring, most of them were not in a geographic pattern that indicated a casino relationship. Uh, the Everett Police Department was one of the, is the only one uh, in this region that has so far introduced a flag in their records management system for an officer to indicate that he knew he knows specifically that the offender or the victim was in uh, in the city to use the casino and the flag has been used uh, a couple of dozen times since the casino opened but mostly for things happening on casino property there's only been three or four cases in which uh, the flag was used and it was somewhere else other than at the, the casino itself and not generally for any of these these in, these crimes that have increased. So um, that is good news. That that that's indicated that there, we haven't seen that kind of direct relationship uh, in those crimes. But th these crimes are up. They're just not uh, specifically tied yet in a way that we can see to Encore Boston Harbor. Now, could these I, Bruce, could I just ask a question on the slide? Um, sure. It caught my eye just because I probably don't understand the statistical analysis at that's all. Okay. Well enough. So I see that all the crimes are higher than the expected range. Oh, yeah, I selected the ones that were specifically for this, this slide. So there, there are lots oh. that weren't, but they're... Oh, that they're, helps me understand yeah. because I was trying to figure out the total crime being in the expected range. Okay, so... Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that makes sense, and I wanted to, to point that out. But in terms of violent, the violent crime is what seemed to be more yeah. on the extraordinary side. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Sure. Um, 
so similar statistics are offered for all of the communities in the report and whenever there was an increase when it when it was above the expected range i offered what i could uh in the way of analysis from the data that i had and then anything that the agency uh, had supplied in addition to that as as an explanation uh, from their end so that's all in the the full written report um but i'll and I'll, I'll indicate what what comes out of that now a couple of patterns to monitor. I I don't see a direct casino relationship yet, and the generally speaking, these crimes. So what I look for are are collaborative or, or uh, complementary increases across multiple jurisdictions. If if some property crime like auto theft only increases in Chelsea, that's you know not not as good evidence of any kind of casino relationship as if it increases in in several communities. Um, so I look for that. I look for uh, geographic patterns that are, are related to the casino, maybe along travel routes uh, and so forth. I look for a logical relationship. We've, we've talked about the, those specific factors before. So these are these are examples of trends that we saw during the first six months that I would say are kind of uh, on the fence. They're, they might have some of those factors, a logical relationship, maybe a, a geographic proximity, but not some of the other ones that I'm looking for. In no case do we have an example of an offender where we can specifically say, yes, this person was casino motivated. Uh, but these are some examples of trends that I want to keep an eye on. If they do continue, if they expand, then um, we're definitely going to need to analyze them in more detail. And Everett and Chelsea were the two agencies to have an increase in aggravated assault, for instance. Uh, mostly, I think, family related uh, violence. I, again, I don't see a logical relationship there to the casino, at least not that quickly uh, after it was built, but we want to keep an eye on that. And if it increase, if it continues to increase, I'll get a sample of actual narratives and, and start to do some, some coding of uh, causal factors for those increases. Uh, Charleston was the, the only neighborhood to see uh, an increase in thefts from vehicles and uh, right in the uh, in the residential area of, of Charlestown, uh, so we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. Auto theft in Charlestown and Malden also went up. Revere had an increase in con game style fraud, and then the the, the Massachusetts State Police data was interesting. That there were a lot of crash increases on local roads, not in any kind of consistent way. Uh, it, it, that was geographically related to Encore Boston Harbor, very, very scattered around the region. But of course, um, traffic's a, a complicated issue to analyze anyway. So um, it, we'll just be keeping an eye on, on increases on on those crashes. Local agencies didn't report any crash increases uh, at all. One of the things that I was particularly interested in looking at, because it's um, it's come up in a couple of places, is traffic collisions that then resulted in a drunk driving arrest or a drunk driving charge. That's probably the best data set we have at this point to estimate how many, any, any increase in drunk driving uh, caused by um, the, the casino. Um, increases based on just raw drunk driving arrests are always a bad statistic to use because they're heavily dependent on what police agencies are doing and, and how they're investing their resources and so forth. But if we look just at those drunk driving arrests that result from a crash, uh, that is independent of, of a police agency's uh, choice of whether to, uh, to to spend more time enforcing drunk driving. And we can see here that Everett, uh, typically before the casino had one to three crashes that later resulted in a drunk driving charge uh, and it had 14. In, in 2019, in the six months after uh, the casino. No other agency saw that kind of increase, just uh, just Everett. And when we look at it geographically, we can see, uh, here's, here's Encore, uh, you can't see my pointer, can you? Can, can you see my cursor S circling yes, around the yes, screen? we can see it. We okay, good. It. Okay, so uh, here, you know, here's the casino, and then you have Broadway here, uh, going up through Everett, mm -hmm. and most of the incidents in Everett, you can see are right along uh, Broadway. So I thought that was a, a quite a lot of uh, smoke uh, that indicated probably a, a casino relationship. But uh, in Everett, they, they looked at every single one of those reports, and they had recorded last drink locations for all of the offenders that they had charged in those 
crashes, and only one of them had uh, had their last drink or had been coming from uh, or otherwise using uh, Encore Boston Harbor. So it it was a lot of smoke without a, a fire that we could find at the end of the day. I'm not prepared to say that there's no relationship just because they didn't have their last drink at, at the casino. The, they might have cha changed their decision to, to drive down that particular route or something else might be going on. There is a big increase in the in drunk driving crashes and it, we, could, we it, need to... could, it, could it also be an increase in police monitoring? Well, th th that's what I'm saying. I, I don't think so because the, a crash had to happen first. If it was just... Oh, a, I see, because it's a crash. And my apologies. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So um, there, yeah, got but, it. But because but, but, drunk driving arrest in total also increased for, for the city of Everett. And that, that could definitely be just, you know, more law enforcement presence. But if it's based on a crash first, that kind of strips out that, that extra factor. Right. Um, so we just need to, to keep working uh, on this one uh, and and come up with a more comprehensive analysis of of those um, those drunk and, driving incidents. And Chief Maisie, if he is in the call, might have some some more to offer on that particular. Uh, thank thank pattern. you, and I won't interject again. I'm feeling like it's a personal conversation now, uh, Professor. Thank you so much. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and so uh, finally, um, I looked at the immediate neighborhoods around. Uh, Encore Boston Harbor to the to the east to the west and to the north. Uh, there's a sh major shopping center there to the west that isn't really directly accessible from the casino. Uh, I, I don't think I I think you can go out like a back door and over a hedge and something and you can get there, but it, it's not you know, really easy to uh, to get to. Uh, and so, but it's the closest major retail center to it. So I thought we should take a look and see if they had any increase in anything. And they didn't, that shopping center uh, was, was very low in crime and didn't see any increase from uh, after Os Encore Boston Harbor. The Eastern neighborhood along Broadway there, um, the those streets sort of have a mixed residential, uh, commercial, industrial uh, presence. And, uh, and then you have a residential neighborhood uh, north of, of Route 16 up here that I also took a look at. We talked about drunk driving on Broadway. That also went up, even not, not just from crashes, but for, uh, total arrests uh, along Broadway increased it uh, also. But we also saw a lot of traffic complaints and parking complaints in this area, in this residential area here to the east and also here to the north. And the hypothesis has been that when the garage fills up, uh, people are parking in the residential neighborhood and walking over there. We don't have uh, a smoking gun there that you know we can we can tie the parking complaint directly to somebody using the casino, and it's we don't collect a lot of data on that type of call for service anyway. But it seems like a logical explanation, and uh, I think it's it, it's con worth continuing to watch. Uh, but it's it's possible that some extra traffic is aggravating the uh, the local community and causing out of towners to park on those streets. Uh, we also had a slight increase in disorderly conduct at businesses uh, in this uh, this area. Uh, you can see the the roast beef shop here. I, I think it's one of them, and then there's a couple of gas stations along here as well. So, uh, j fairly minor disorder and and traffic stuff directly. Uh, in the radius uh, of the casino. Now, um, obviously the, the COVID-19 outbreak is gonna have a major impact on this study and on future studies. Um, this study went through the end of, of the year. And since the end of the year, we've only had an extra two months worth of activity at Encore Boston Harbor before, before it had to close. Um, so, it would be fairly meaningless to do any analysis of what's happening in the region for the the months of March to May, except in the extent that uh, of a very indirect uh, uh, hypothesis of, of the casino causing uh, just from causing general economic increases in the area also being related to certain crimes. But with the casino being closed, my point is that, you know, we wouldn't see a lot of direct evidence of a casino relationship uh, to crime uh, for the March to May period. The more, uh, the bigger issue though, is that with everything being closed, crime, well, I, I don't know this is specifically for Everett, uh, and the Everett area, but across the nation, crime has been down uh, during the, these closures, street crime at least. Uh, domestic violence in some jurisdictions has seen an increase. Overall, this 
the closures caused by, by COVID-19 have really changed uh, crime trends across the country. And it's going to be very difficult going forward to separate those changes from anything caused by a particular facility. Uh, at least I think it will be. I, obviously, we don't have the data to uh, to look at yet. And even after the casinos re reopen, other businesses are going to remain closed. Uh, and even after they all reopen, it's possible that the the effects of these these closures and of the, the disease itself are going to have lingering um, impacts on crime for years uh, going forward. And so it's going to be necessary to create models that somehow control for that when we're looking at the impact of a particular facility. So I don't know what that's going to look like yet. I'm just getting into researching that. And I need to consult with some experts in quant quantitative evaluative research to help me do that. But I think that from what I'm hearing so far, I mean, everybody is is thinking, wow, this is going to really change the nature of that sort of research. It's just completely unprecedented. We, we don't have anything to look to like this except uh, maybe going back to, say, September 11th, when you know some major societal impact like that uh, had, had reverberations for many different types of crime across the country. So what the next reports look like is is a big question mark at this point, and I'm going to have to obviously have some long conversations with Mr. Vanderlinden about that, and and um, we'll we'll see in the future. Uh, Christopher, this is uh, Gail Cameron. Sure. Um, I think your example of, um, in particular, the drunk driving cases, uh, was a really a good example of. Uh, how the extra step of drilling down, and I want to commend uh, Everett PD for being willing to do that, meaning pulling every single case and looking at the narrative, finding out where that last drink is. And I know you've worked with their uh, uh, crime analysis team really effectively, as you have throughout this, the, uh, the state with our different licensees. But I, I think that's, that's an example of one that can really be, you can jump to a conclusion and say, wow, look at this. Um, but the drilling down, obviously you're not making a definitive statement that it's not related, but that extra step really helps in, in putting this uh, data into con uh, uh, context. And, and it's a good example too of how um, the chiefs from around the state are really engaged in this process and um, Know, they want to know what they can do to mitigate uh, whatever is happening in the region. So I thank you and, and the Everett team for that. Absolutely. Do we have questions for um, Professor Bruce? Um, and also we might as well, I think we can offer Mark, uh, we can offer if, if um, Captain Connors and, and Chief Macy are available, perhaps they either want to comment or our commissioners would ask them a question. I, I do know that Everett has taken the lead on that program. But excellent, fascinating too for you, um, Professor, in terms of what you've got to deal with going forward. Uh, Madam Chair, um, Christopher, this is Commissioner Stebbins. Thanks, uh, as always, for your excellent presentation. You answered one of my questions, which not only relates to Encore Boston Harbor, but our other gaming sites, which is what the impact of the, the COVID-19 closures will be. Um, as, I, as I read through the end of your report, you talked about some future plans or analytical plans. You talked about the potential to measure Encore Boston Harbor against other casinos and normalizing that research by the number of visitors. Um, in doing that type of research, how do you consider the the population in the the local community or the local region as part of the research? That, that's a really good question, um, and it, it it does have to be factored in. But I the, the simple answer is I don't know yet. <laughs> uh, the, part of the, my research has to to be into the specific models, and yes, so we we have to consider you know obviously the crime calls for service at the facility. Uh, but also, and the number of users of the facility, but also the 
the number of, of, of people in the, the local area because a casino in the middle of the woods uh, that has three million visitors still is not the same thing as a casino in the middle of a city that has three million visitors. I don't know specifically mathematically how, how I'm going to control for that yet, but I, I can promise that it is part of the equation in, in any event. Okay. Well, obvious, obviously, you know, um, our other licensees have more facilities kind of across the United States yeah. and in different regions. So that, uh, that might allow you an easier path, but, um, as always, thanks for your good work. Sure. Captain Connors, did I, I see you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> how are you doing? I'm doing great. Great. Good. Um, would you like to chime in with any of your observations, comments? No, I think uh, just to follow up on some some of the areas that Christopher touched on. Um, I mean, I, I would concur at least just uh, from our view over those uh, last six months, or those six months of the study. Um, you know, some of the issues that we deal with in, internally, I guess, in, in, inside the facility. Uh, I know this is more focused on what's going on out and around the facility, but um, but I do think we have a uh, us working closely with Everett Police and, and some of the other um, cities and towns in the area and getting this feedback continuously that we do have our thumb on the pulse as to what exactly is going on out there um, and how that you know may carry from inside the facility to outside or vice versa. Um, I think having our presence on site, we're able to monitor that very closely. So um, uh, you know some of these things will continue to work with Christopher going forward. Uh, not only for Encore, but the other the other two locations as well, and just continue to to um, you know assist in any way that we can to make sure these reports to the commission are as accurate as they, they need to be. Questions for Captain Connors? Well, we thank thank you. Uh, oh, I, Commissioner Zuniga. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just more of a comment, perhaps, and uh, you know, if if others want to react to it. I, um, I'm glad that uh, uh, Christopher and, and, and others are already thinking about how to account for what is likely going to be this very different set of circumstances and possibly trends. Um, for many reasons, they can cut. They could cut in many different ways. There might be some more economic anxiety, societally, etc., um, as well as what is likely going to be less visitation. Uh, when, when the casinos uh, reopen. Um, I'm, I would only mention that uh, I'm glad we have the structure that we have, the infrastructure that we have, the commitment to continue studying this uh, um, ongoing, as, as Mark mentioned, is the mandate of the research uh, agenda and the collaboration and input of all the agencies that have, uh, and, and the help, of course, of uh, Christopher, uh, uh, Brian and, and uh, Chief Macy and all the chiefs around us to continue to um, to study this. I think it's critical that uh, even though things are going to change, perhaps in, in in important ways, that we continue to study. Any further questions? Uh, I'm not sure if. Um... Chief Macy is available, but I do know that I think on behalf of all the commissioners, we thank you. We know that you have uh, taken on that important um, leadership initiative in terms of, of flagging the EBH connection. So thank you for that. Um, Mark, other comments? Uh, yeah, I think, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Just building on what Commissioner Zuniga um, just said, that that we have a system in place. Um, we have consistent methods. Uh, we, Christopher Bruce has been a fantastic um, resource for the commission to help us build this aspect of our research agenda. And, um, and this will serve us well moving forward. Um, you know, we, we're under unprecedented times right now. Um, and it will be interested to continue to monitor to see um, how that impacts um, public safety uh, moving forward and um, with a critical eye on really trying to drill down to, to that causation. Um, so uh, we look forward to, to moving this forward. I think uh, the next step um, for uh, Christopher is, um, at least for Encore Boston Harbor, is, is taking a look at, at a one year uh, report 
Um, so he would begin uh, gathering data for that relatively soon. And again, it'll, it'll clearly be impacted by the casino closure and the COVID uh, uh, virus. So, um, but he also continues to work on um, on examining impacts in Springfield and and Plainville. So he's busy. In addition to his uh, leading a, his coursework. No so, further questions. Commissioner O'Brien, are you all set? No, I am. I, I would just reiterate too that um, um, I'm sorry, Chief Maisie isn't here because I was also very impressed with Everett's ability to do deep dives. Their crime analysts were incredibly helpful in terms of drilling down on the OUI stats. Um, and hopefully next time we can get more from uh, Medford and MBTA and hopefully Cambridge. Yes, right. Okay, well, well, thank you, Christopher. We appreciate um, your attending today, your presentation, and we wish you well. Moving on to the um, next item on our agenda, already item number five, Racing Division. Alex, Dr. Lightbound, there you are. Good morning. Good morning. So, um, on uh, March 20th, uh, I came before the commission um, recommending along with Steve O'Toole from um, Plain Ridge Park that we postpone the um, April opening of Plain Ridge live racing until June 1st. Um, at that time, there were um, recommendations from the CDC and an order from the governor about um, different sizes of um, gatherings that were um, allowed. Um, and um, we based it pr primarily on that. Um, since then, um, the governor is, um, as everyone I'm sure is aware, has had um, several um, times re-upped an order for um, non-COVID essential services to seize in-person operations, and that's been extended to May 18th. Um, with that order, um, speaking with Chris McElwain, the Vice President of Racing for Penn National Gaming, um, and I, we felt it wasn't realistic to um, keep that June 1 date for live racing. Um, we understand the hardship this creates on the horsemen um, and for each of our staffs. Um, and um, we're trying to weigh uh, the best way to open safely for everybody, um, as well as be able to um, regulate the industry. Um, to that end, um, we've um, met with uh, the horsemen, um, Todd Grossman, our uh, general counsel, and Bill Egan, our um, licensing specialist at Plain Ridge, and I, we met with the horsemen and Chris McElwain virtually uh, last week. Um, the horsemen have uh, uh, presented a risk management plan. It's based heavily on the Standard Bread Canada plan. Um, that is um, a, a starting point. Um, I just want to mention that as soon as Steve O'Toole and I, uh, when we began the discussion about delaying the opening, in that same conversation, we started discussing how we would be able to reopen and things that would need to be done. So it's not like we've just started thinking about this. Um, and, um, you know, I've been gathering information from different uh, tracks that have opened. Um, so far, the tracks that have been able to stay open or open have all been thoroughbred tracks. There's some um, different, um, organizational ways that are different from the standard bread tracks. Um, and right now there aren't any standard bread tracks racing in the country. Um, so um, we're going to continue to work. Um, Chris McElwain is devising a plan. Um, as you know, they have um, I don't know, seven or eight different racetracks across the country. So they're coming up with a plan in general that will probably also maybe drill down to some specifics um, for individual states. Um, I was on a webinar yesterday with Mass Veterinary School and the Mass Veterinary Association talking about um, veterinary procedures in these days. As you know, um, we have several different veterinary jobs at the racetrack. Um, we have a veterinarian that administers Lasix. There's uh, the commission veterinarians that are um, in charge of testing. And there's an association veterinarian that um, watches the horses on the racetrack and, and handles emergencies and that type of thing. 
Um, at, at Tufts right now, they're um, not allowing any clients into the building. Um, they have what they call a runner that um, goes out to the car in full um, PPE. Um, they get the um, animal from the um, client and uh, take it into the office, uh, into the hospital. And then um, it's exchanged. Uh, the leash, different leashes are put on them, the whole thing. They disinfect the carriers, they disinfect the animals. Um, so there are some very stringent um, policies being done. Um, on the racing end of it, um, obviously some tracks have been able to continue racing and um, we're going to follow um, their, you know, some of what they've done and their guidance um, to come up with a plan. Um, we have different areas that we need to look at. For instance, um, the judges and how they would operate. Um, the, our licensing department and how they would operate. Um, so there's a lot of different moving parts, but we'll we'll be able to look at these different areas. Um, think of what else? Um, let's see. Um, so we'll just continue to um, review the different um, policies and procedures. Obviously, we're also um, looking to see what the governors. Um, committee comes out with, they may have some very good suggestions for us that will um, obviously that will incorporate. And um, I'll, from there, I'll just let you know that um, Bob McHugh and uh, from the, the president of the Harness Horsemen's Association and uh, Chris McElean, vice president of racing for Penn National Gam Gaming are um, on the meeting today if the um, commission has any questions. Jennifer Alex. Yeah, Dr. Lightbaum, I just, I want to thank you for really, I, I had a conversation with um, Dr. Lightbaum earlier before this meeting, and uh, I just want to thank her for really um, keeping track of worldwide, basically, what's happening with racing and thinking about best practices for us, because it, it will be a challenge um, to do it safely. It doesn't mean an insurmountable challenge, but it, it will be a challenge. So. Um, and I know that's difficult for the, for the horsemen and women to hear because they would love to get back to their livelihoods sooner rather than later. We certainly understand that, but uh, safety is a key piece. So um, I was happy to hear that you are engaged uh, with, uh, with Penn as far as a, a plan, something that we can look at and understand the details. Um, so, so just thanks for your leadership there. And it was really apparent to me that you really, um, you know, diving into this and trying to figure out what we need to do to do it safely. It's a little bit different than gaming, obviously, so we need to pay attention to this community as well. So thanks. Thank you. Further questions? Oh, Commissioner Zuniga. Thank you. Um, thank you for the update, uh, um, Alex. I was, uh, just a couple of questions. Um, is there any indication that horses have a um, key their carry or are affected uh, or can transmit the virus um, at this point you know that is there, there hasn't been any reports of horses carrying it um, there um, obviously is some uh, discussion on um, cats and um, a lot of the veterinary hospitals are treating cats with um, respiratory signs very carefully in case it may be um, COVID um, there have been a few reported cases in um, dogs, but that doesn't necessarily um, mean that they're infective to humans. Um, they may have gotten it from their humans. <laughs> um, and they, from what I understand, the dogs have not been showing any uh, respiratory signs. And that's really, um, I hate to comment too much on it because that's still very much under investigation. But so far, there haven't been any reports of uh, horses spreading it. Great. And, um, so along those lines, do you imagine uh, a scenario in which perhaps the races can be conducted uh, in which there's no spectators, uh, so, uh, you know, similarly to what they're doing in other countries for actually human sports? They, uh, numerous tracks, on uh, the thoroughbred tracks that are open um, now have been doing that. They've been racing without um, spectators. Um, some of the differences with the um, harness is that um, in harness racing, 
the horses are brought into a paddock area, um, you know, hours before they race. So um, that's some of the things that we're looking at is can that be changed? And how do we still maintain um, security over those horses if we do change that? Um, a number of the thoroughbred tracks have very um, tight control over the participants. Um, they, uh, a lot of them actually live on the grounds and the horses are stabled on the grounds. And they've even gone so far as to um, limit what uh, jockeys can come into the um, track. They basically have the colony of regular riders that are there and um, it's very difficult for a rider from out of state to come in. Um, some of them don't allow it at all or, and some have certain procedures. Um, and um, even with racing officials, some of the plans I've seen um, ask the racing officials to actually live on the ground. So it's a very, um, you know, secluded community there. Um, one of the issues that with Plain Ridge is that we do, um, when we're running a regular meet, we'll have horses and obviously coming with their people um, that come from, you know, New York, New Jersey, um, Connecticut, Rhode Island. Uh, Maine, New Hampshire, um, Vermont, you know, all, all around. So that's one of the things that we'll need to look at, um, as well as the horsemen will need to look at it. Some of them, um, their states may have restrictions on if they can go out of state and come back um, and that type of thing. So it does get a little complicated where um, we can't just, uh, we don't have a group of um, horsemen that are living on the grounds with their horses. Um, that we could easily just start up with them right now. Well, to that point, that is why we will be looking for the, the guidance from the, um, the Governor's uh, Advisory Board. <clears throat> I, I'm, I have, um, I suspect there may be mandates that will, will uh, obviously give us immediate guidance and then there may be guidelines and, and then there'll be probably where we have to extrapolate. So, sure. it's, so it's excellent that you are doing all of this work and collecting really what will be the best practices because um, this, is, this is very, your industry does present very unique challenges. So thank you. Thank you. Madam, Madam Chair, if I could just, um, thank you. Um, Alex, first of all, uh, uh, a great job. I also wanna just acknowledge as uh, Commissioner Cameron did the, the documents and letters that we received uh, from the harness horsemen and even some of the extensive work that they went into to look at um, best practices being used at other tracks. And I think Alex, you just pointed out a big difference, which is the difference between a ship-in track and you know those tracks that make accommodations for housing, et cetera, available on their property. Um, I would hope that, you know, as we think as you and Chris and Steve O'Toole think about the um, procedures for being able to reopen uh, horse racing uh, safely um, and obviously following the other guidelines that we're required to follow in Massachusetts that um, there also be some discussion about changing up and reviewing the schedule uh, and the potential days of racing as, as, uh, uh, as we look ahead. I think that's a critical component of it. Yes, uh, and in the, in the past, Penn has, um, if we've lost a day to um, weather, you know, different types of things like that, um, Penn has always been um, very eager to make that, that day up. Uh, um, that being said, those were only, you know, an isolated day or two here or there. And so it, it will be a discussion to have um, once we have a firmer idea on exactly how many days um, of racing we'll, mi we'll miss due to postponement, um, and then weigh in factors like what the purse account's going to look like. Um, obviously the Racehorse Development Fund um, money is going to be uh, greatly decreased with the casinos being closed. Um, so um, once we get to a point where some of these issues are clear about when money may start coming in, and um, how many days we might be talking about it certainly um, will be a, a good um, topic to sit down and, and try to figure out what can be done. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Alex, you've made a recommendation in your mem a memorandum. Do you just want to remind the commission of that? 
Oh, yes, um, my uh, recommendation was to um, postpone the opening of Plain Ridge um, indefinitely. Um, and we just wanted to um, try to um, kind of manage expectations. Um, and um, obviously, when we get to the point that the state and the commission <coughs> and stakeholders all feel comfortable opening, um, we can come back with an actual date at that point. And so you do need a vote today. Um, without, if, unless there are further questions for Dr. Lightbound, do I have a motion? Yeah, Madam Chair, I move that the commission postpone the June 1st, 2020 live racing opening of Plain Ridge Racecourse until further notice as described in the memorandum dated May 7th, 2020 in the consent packet. And second. Any further questions? Okay, we'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And chair votes yes, that's 5-0. Thank you, thank you Dr. Lightbound. And you do have um, your next item on the agenda, which is um, regarding the quarterly local aid payment. And we have Chad uh, Borg, our chief financial analyst, who I do see on our screen. So good morning, Chad. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, so um, in accordance with budget and appropriation 1050-140, uh, the quarterly local aid payment to each city and town where racing activities are conducted. The amounts for this quarter's payments are calculated by using the handles from racing that took place in July, August, and September of 2019. That said, the total local aid payment for the quarter ending March 31st is $226,583.95. Um, on the second page, you will see a breakdown of the handles as well as uh, the distribution amounts that are payable to each city and town. Questions for Chad? Chad, you always do such a thorough job on these. Very, uh, very clear, straightforward. So uh, thank you. That may explain why there aren't questions. <laughs> Sorry, it may come across a little bland, but um, I, I thank you for that. <laughs> no such thing as bland. <laughs> do we have any questions? Barring that, I do believe that Chad needs a vote here. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the local aid quarterly payment for March 31st, 2020 is uh, provided in the um, in today's meeting packet. Second. Thank you, Commissioner Cameron. Any questions for chat at this point? Okay. Barring none. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. He's on mute. Yeah, you're on mute. Uh, Commissioner Stebbins. I'm sorry, aye. technical difficulties. Aye, Madam Chair, I'm sorry. No, no problem. Okay, we have Commissioner Zuniga with an aye and Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. Aye, and the chair votes yes, 5-0. Thank you, and thank you, Chad. You know, these are really in, um, important reports reporting in procedures and practices that we really need to um, to uh, retain and uh, comply with during the, this uh, unusual time. Thank you to Director Wells and to the entire team for keeping us moving on all of these these matters. Next we have item, oh, and Dr. Lightbound, thank you and, and good luck. Thank you. You and Chad, stay safe. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on to item number six, IEB. Karen, I think you'll be introducing Kate today. That's correct. Uh, we have a qualifier for your consideration regarding suitability, and so I'm going to turn it over to Kate Hardigan, our Enforcement Counsel, to do the presentation. Good morning. Good morning, Kate. Uh, very nice to see you all. Uh, good morning, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, the corporate qualifier for your consideration today is uh, Kevin Charles Miller. He's a qualifier for MGM Springfield. Uh, Mr. Miller uh, has submitted all of the required forms and complied with all of the IEB's requests for supplemental and updated information. 
the IEB conducted its complete protocol for suitability for casino qualifiers, and we confirmed financial stability and integrity, reviewed litigation history, searched criminal history, verified that no prohibited political contributions were made in Massachusetts, and conducted checks of open on databases. The team for this investigation was comprised of Trooper Kevin Owen of the Massachusetts State Police Gaming Enforcement Unit and financial investigator Matthew Jordan. IEB investigators were able to interview Mr. Miller in person at the offices of the commission at 101 Federal Street in Boston. This interview took place on January 29th, 2019. Mr. Miller was cooperative and forthcoming in all aspects of the investigation. Uh, Mr. Miller joined MGM International in September of 2018 as the Vice President of Privacy. In this position, he is responsible for ensuring that the company collects, uses, and disposes of the information that it gathers from customers in a way that is compliant with the laws and the jurisdictions in which the company operates. Mr. Miller is based out of Las Vegas and prior to working for MGM, he worked for the Environmental Protection Agency in Durham, North Carolina from January of 1992 to January of 1997 as the lead network systems analyst there. Uh, he also worked for Herman Miller Incorporated located in Zeeland, Michigan from August 1999 to January 2013 as a network architect and contractor there and then moved to Juniper Networks Incorporated in Sunnyvale, California, where he was employed from January 2013 to May 2014 as a security consultant. Uh, Mr. Miller then moved to Fortnet, and again in Sunnyvale, California, where he was employed from May 2014 to March 2015 as their National Account System Engineering Lead. And then Mr. Miller returned to the Herman Miller Incorporated in Zeeland, Michigan, where he was employed as their Chief of Information Security uh, from March of 2015 to September of 2018. The background review conducted by the IEB confirmed that Mr. Miller completed his undergraduate studies at the College of Charleston, where he received a Bachelor of Science degree in Computer Science. Mr. Miller has demonstrated to the IEB by clear and convincing evidence that he is suitable, and the IEB recommends that the commission vote to find him suitable as a qualifier for MGM Springfield. Thank you. Oh, Madam Chair, I think you're still on mute. It's, it's, um, it's always entertaining to write material for uh, how these meetings go virtually. Um, so uh, first off, Kate, thank you. Excellent presentation. And, and we appreciate both the written report and your oral presentation today. Do we have questions for Kate? I do believe that you are seeking a vote um, on this, so you do need that for, for us. Um, Commissioner O'Brien, are you able to assist on that? Please. Oh, she's also on mute. Uh, I can, if Kate can remind me of um, Mr. Oh, Mr. Miller's full name. I'm oh, sorry, certainly. I'm not pulling it up. <laughs> Certainly, his full name is Kevin Charles Miller. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the commission um, approve uh, the qualifier status of uh, MGM employee Kevin Charles Miller as set forth this morning by Ms. Hardigan and relayed in the information provided to the commission earlier. Thank you. Second. Second. Any questions again at this point? Barring none, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And Chair votes yes, five zero, an excellent job. Thank you. And again, important work for us to continue to, to move on at this time. So thank you. And thank also you thank much. you to Loretta. Yes, thank you. Be well, Kate. Thank you. Nice to see you all. Take care. Okay, moving on to um, item number seven. We have four subsections today. Uh, Interim General Counsel Grossman, if you could proceed. And I believe we have um, uh, uh, Associate General Counsel Troisi. There she is. Carrie has joined us as well. Thank you. Good morning, Carrie. Good morning. 
Good morning, Madam Chair, and thank you, and good morning, Commissioners. Uh, the first item up uh, for your consideration, we have uh, before you up for potential final review and adoption are amendments to 205 CMR 134.09 relative to the use of sealed or expunged records of criminal or delinquency cases as part of the suitability review process uh, for employees and vendors of the casinos. A public hearing was held um, on this proposal on April 28th, uh, which was presided over by Commissioner Stebbins. We did receive some public comments relative to this proposal, which have been included in your packet, and there were some commenters, uh, the same folks uh, at the public hearing. Um, and I certainly, of course, uh, invite Commissioner Stebbins uh, to uh, offer some uh, thoughts and comments as well. I think we do want to actually pause and discuss at least one of the comments uh, that was raised as part of uh, the process. Uh, Commissioner Stebbins, do you, do you want to uh, uh, chime in or should I keep going? Um, keep going, I can offer okay. some comments at the end. Absolutely. Um, so the, the one comment in particular uh, pertain to the use of information relative to delinquency matters as opposed to the sealed or expunged records that the uh, was the prime subject of the proposal. At present, the commission reg uh, Commission's regulations make uh, clear that adjudica adjudications of delinquency are not considered convictions for purposes of making suitability determinations. However, the regulation does say that such information uh, may be considered in making suitability determinations. So the, the public comment points out that under chapter 119 of the general law, section 60, that use of such Im information is actually limited in certain circumstances. Um, and its use is permissible in some ways, but, but not others. It seems to me that this is an issue that the commission should review um, or re-review as the case may be, because this may have been an issue that the commission considered at some point in its history. Um, but for our purposes here today, in my opinion, the issue should be separated uh, from the amendments pertaining to the use of the sealed records. The use of the delinquency information was not part of the noticing of this matter. Um, and so it seems to me should be handled on its own, though it is certainly an important issue that I, I do think we should uh, take up. Um, so the use of sealed records though, has made its way through the full promulgation process. And as I mentioned, there was a public hearing. So it is ripe for final review and decision by the commission here today. Uh, we have included in your packet an amended small business impact statement, which would require uh, your review and approval as well as part of the final adoption. And if you are uh, comfortable with the language uh, that has been proposed, ultimately a, a final vote of approval uh, would be invited. And that would allow uh, us to uh, make the formal final filings for this amendment. So I, thought, I think I'll just pause there, if I may, and um, ask if there are any questions or any uh, discussion. Oh, Madam Chair, you're on mute. Um, I presided over the, um, you presided over the hearing. I did, I did attend it. Do you want to try and... Sure. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, I want to thank the legal team for their good work on this. And obviously, as um, Councillor Grossman pointed out, there were some additional issues raised uh, around this in, uh, around this issue of delinquencies uh, for juveniles and uh, their use in some of the uh, considerations around uh, background checks and licensing. Um, specific to the to the change uh, or the update to this regulation, um, I certainly want to uh, offer my thanks to to Jill Griffin and the team. Uh, Jill was a point of contact with a, a number of the um, stakeholder organizations that have supported this clarification, and those were the folks that were able to join our our hearing. 
uh, the Citizens Action Network, as well as I believe Greater Boston Legal Services also weighed in. So uh, I always appreciate the hearing process when uh, we hold a hearing and, and folks do step up and find time to uh, offer their comments and contributing. Um, again, I think this change is going to help us uh, allow for proper access to to paths, uh, uh, pathways and careers in this industry for Massachusetts residents. But uh, I also echo what Councillor Grossman said. Uh, we should probably go back and review um, uh, just for a level of comfort uh, uh, the suitability and use of these juvenile delinquencies in the process. But again, as you pointed out, this is kind of separate, uh, not completely distinct, but separate from uh, the item that's up for consideration today. Do I have questions from other commissioners? I do have one comment or question. Yeah, uh, okay. Madam Chair, I just, I agree uh, with, uh, with our interim general counsel and well as uh, Commissioner Stebbins that uh, we should take up the delinquency issue at a later date in the near future. And certainly the public comments now mirror our hearing in, in which they were very thoughtful about uh, explaining um, their ideas and their thoughts as well as the law. So um, I just wanna thank everybody again for um, taking this issue seriously and help us, help us understand it in a way that uh, really makes a lot of sense. Any other questions, comments? Um, I agree that this doesn't, uh, the, the comments that were raised don't affect today's action. I'm not sure if I would recommend that we, um, as the commission, wait on reviewing the comments with respect to uh, the juvenile matters. The commission may not need to act, but I would want to make sure that if we are processing, you know, looking at, at juvenile records during this, this period, um, that we are complying with the law that Pauline Carrion raised. So regardless of whether or not it's in, in, in accord with our regulation, if there's any way that there's some that uh, Pauline may have raised in her, um, both her comments and her, and her letter that suggests we might want to look very carefully at the, our statutory guidance. Um, I'd appreciate that to just make sure we're fully compliant with the law. Okay. Yeah, Madam Chair, my understanding is that we had done that initially and upon review, and our Chief Enforcement Counsel actually, when this comment came in, has is going to pull the record to ensure exactly what you're saying that we are in, in compliance with the law. But I le believe that is is accurate. Excellent, thank you. And yeah. then we need to tweak or amend our regulation. We can make sure to keep uh, Greater Boston Legal Services informed um, on our thinking make sure we're aligned. Excellent, yeah. thank you. Any other questions? Excellent. We do need um, a vote on this though, correct, uh, yeah. Mr. Grossman? Yes, Madam Chair, two votes please. One on the amended small business impact statement and one on the draft language. Okay. So, Madam Chair, I move that the commission approve the amended small business impact statement for 205 CMR 13409. Um, Wait a minute, is that the right motion? Yes, it is. Yeah, okay. 134.09 uh, uh, investigation, determination, and appeals for gaming establishment employees and vendors as included in the commissioner's packet. Second. Any questions or comments? Okay, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. Commissioner Zunica. Aye. Chair says yes, five zero. Uh, Madam Chair, I further move that the commission adopt the version of the amendments to 205 CMR 13409 investigation, determination and appeals for gaming establishment employees and vendors as included in the commissioner's packet and authorize the staff to take all steps necessary to finalize the regulation promulgation process. Thank you, second. Second. Thank you. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. 
Mm, Chair Bunch, yes, thank you. Five zero. Excellent work. Moving on to five B, the BSE. Thank you, and I. I'd just like to turn things over to Carrie Therese. She, she's taken the lead on behalf of the legal department on the next two matters. And uh, so if I may, I'll ask Carrie to lead the presentation. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so Good morning. the next item on the agenda is the final draft of amendments to 205 CMR 133.04 related to the self-exclusion list. Um, this regulation you saw at the end of February uh, and you voted to begin the promulgation process at that time. We held a public hearing on April 28th uh, and received no comment on this regulation and at this point are looking for a vote to finalize the promulgation process and file this regulation with the Secretary of State's office. Any questions? Um, Commissioner yeah. Cameron? No questions. Okay, sorry, I, I, you lit up. <laughs> Always are illuminated, Commissioner Cameron. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I, this was the other regulation that was uh, on the agenda for our recent hearing, and uh, it did not invite any public comment at the regulation hearing that we held. And thank, thank you, Commissioner Stebbins, for um, presiding at that. Okay. Um, Carrie, your work was so excellent that there are apparently no questions um, over the course of time. So um, we can proceed perhaps with a vote. Um, Madam Chair, I move that the commission approve the amended small business impact statement for 205 CMR 133.04, duration of exclusion and removal from the list as included in the commissioner's packet. Second. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Moving forward, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. Chair Bilch, yes, five zero. Again, Sharon, thank you. Um, Madam Chair, I further move the commission adopt the version of amendments 205 CMR 133.04, duration of exclusion and removal from the list as included in the commissioner's packet, packet and authorize staff to take all steps necessary to finalize the regulation promulgation process. Second. Any questions, comments? Hearing none, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes, five zero. And again, Sharon, thank you so much. Carrie, thank you. Thank you. Um, so the next, <laughs> thank you. Next on the agenda is the draft uh, 205 CMR 109.01, uh, which is the authority of the commission to act in an emergency situation. Uh, we brought this regulation to you two weeks ago for an initial discussion, um, and we uh, reached out to the licensees for comment after that. Um, we did receive a few comments and we made a couple of changes to the regulation based on those comments. So in your packet, you have a red line. Um, keep in mind that this, this regulation is entirely new. The, reg the two red lines just reflect changes that were made since the last time you saw it. Uh, so the first change, we removed the term general welfare so that um, that sentence now reads that action may be taken to protect the health or safety, uh, et cetera. Um, there were some concerns that um, it could potentially lead to um, being unintentionally overbroad. Um, for example, general welfare could relate to the financial well-being of licensees, employees, and that's certainly not what we intended from this regulation. So we think that um, using health or safety still accomplishes what we intended here, uh, and removing general welfare uh, eliminates any um, potential overreaching. Um, the second change that we made was we added language to the uh, section at the end that allows the Bureau to take action immediately to clarify that in the event the Bureau were taking action to close a casino, uh, they would work with the licensee to ensure that the closure was done in a safe and orderly way. Um, this was just in uh, responding to comment that um, closure isn't quite so simple as just saying the casino is closed and we're shutting the doors that there is a process that would need to be followed. So we wanted to account for that in the regulation. Um, are there I, any questions? I have a question on that. Um, so I see that edit. 
there isn't a correlated or a parallel at edit to the commission's decision to the commission or closure the difference is that um the way the statute is written it allows the bureau to act immediately where uh, the commission um needs to give the licensee an opportunity first um, to comment but the commission could act immediately I, I, am I, I want to make sure that if the commission decided to act, it could act on its own and not wait for the IEB. Am I, am I misinterpreting this, Commissioner O'Brien? Uh, no, but my understanding is that there are due process hearing and notice requirements that attach to us even calling an emergency meeting and noticing that you may have a circumstance where you need immediate in, in terms of minutes or hours to make a decision and IEB can do that in a manner that doesn't require that notice and that so that's the distinction. Yeah so I yes that I appreciate so in other words we would have to give notice as we did actually on March 14th. Correct. So um, and we did of course have the full cooperation of the licensees in terms of a safe and orderly closure. Do we have to worry about that with respect to this regulation? I don't think so. My understanding is, is that the issue and concern raised by the licensees was sufficiently addressed in connection with IEB and the immediacy that's involved in inheriting their authority. I think my understanding, and Carrie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that the comments back from the licensees didn't raise any parallel concern in terms of how we wrote it in terms of commission authority. Right, because this is dealing with the reg, and I wasn't, and I was going to return to Carrie, of course, but I just know that um, this, uh, the genesis of this regulation came from work that Commissioner O'Brien and I did with you folks on, on the, you know, back in earlier in March. So I wanted to make sure I was clear. Uh, Carrie, do you see any concern for that as well? No, I don't see any concern. I, I would echo exactly what Commissioner O'Brien said. I think. Um, that this change addresses the concerns from the licensees uh, and that the process would be different in the event the commission were making the decision to close. And now if you wanna continue with your presentation, but I just thought that oh, sure. I, I wanted to, that language, I just didn't see it in connection yep. with the commission and I, I was concerned. Thank you so much. Absolutely. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. So with this regulation, um, we uh, have drafted it so that it could be voted on uh, and approved to um, promulgate by emergency, which would allow it to go into effect immediately. Uh, if we do that, then um, we would begin the standard promulgation process after it's been put into effect by emergency, um, which would allow for public comment and a hearing and then uh, final promulgation, um, which would probably occur in two to three months. So um, if you're comfortable with the regulation, then we would be looking for a vote to promulgate this by emergency today. Uh, and then this would go into effect immediately. And, and I would just add that part of the emergency uh, mechanism we're using, because we, we this could be done in shutting down and then putting conditions as we reopen. And so, this is not just a situation of shutting down. This is actually the emergency is also where we are now in terms of what we may need to do to comply with the governor's advisory board minimum requirements and or the request by the licensees and approval by IEB in terms of conditions. So that's sort of why this emergency situation is ongoing and why we're, why we'd be making the request that way. Any questions for Carrie? No, just a comment that the edits seem very reasonable and, um, and appropriate with the intention of uh, how we came about to, to, to put this uh, regulation um, you know, together. I, I, I know it was in, embedded in uh, different parts of uh, the statute. Um, this is not necessarily an entirely new regulation, um, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very comfortable proceeding with these edits. Any other questions? Any clarifications? Um, Karen, did you want to clarify? I, I couldn't tell if you were leaning in or not. No, no, no. I'm, I'm all set. I, I think the uh, recommendation is appropriate. I think the staff and uh, Eileen did a great job on putting this together. It's going to be uh, important going forward. So it certainly qualifies for an emergency regulation. Yes. Commissioner Zuniga, all set? 
I, I, I agree. Um, I'm very thankful and appreciative of the work that was done really over a short period of time, Commissioner O'Brien leading it. Um, it really does help clarify what was really a, a, a little bit of a, a difficult statutory analysis to navigate. So I appreciate the clarity um, that the reg provides and thank and thank you for today's clarification. It helps me as I reviewed this um, without having a chance to speak to you in advance. So thank you. So if we have no further questions or comments, uh, you do want us to vote for the next step on the emergency uh, process. Yes, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, I move that the commission approve the small business impact statement for a 205 CMR 109.01 .01, authority of the commission to act in an emergency situation as included in the commissioner's packet. Second. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Stebbins. Okay, hearing no further questions or comments for Carrie and Todd, um, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. I vote yes. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Todd. And thank you, Commissioner O'Brien, for that. Uh, uh, and Madam Chair, I further move the commission adopt by emergency uh, the version of 205 CMR 109.01 .01, authority the commission to act in an emergency situation as included in the packet and authorize staff to take all steps necessary to commence the regulation promulgation process. Second. I second. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, hearing no further comments. Again, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner uh, Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stephens. Aye. Thank you. Uh, Chair votes yes, 5-0. Thank you, Shara. Thank you now, uh, Carrie and uh, Todd, and particularly Commissioner O'Brien on the initiation. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, um, and then we have our last item under legal today. Todd, if you want to take that. Sure. Um, and Todd, I can, I can jump in if you want me to sort of start things off and then lead into the uh, sort of the legal analysis there, if that's helpful. Yeah, Karen, sure. Why don't you? Okay. Uh, Thank you, Karen. So, so the uh, the reason this is on the agenda is just to get, there's not a vote, there's just some guidance for staff and community, just some feedback from the commissioners and some guidance for staff in, in having a discussion with the uh, licensees regarding the quarterly reports. Generally, historically, the quarterly reports that have been given to the commission have been quite fulsome with information about activity at the casino uh, and also job numbers, et cetera. Obviously with this shutdown, a lot of that information is no longer uh, happening at the casino and therefore wouldn't be able to be translated to a quarterly report. So um, what may be helpful is for um, Joe Delaney just to comment on some of the uh, comments from the licensees. But my understanding, in summary, they're asking for some kind of relief on the requirements for the quarterly reporting uh, because uh, two of the three don't have their full employee staff and that's burdensome to be doing these uh, long PowerPoint presentations and doing that work. Uh, and so it may be an appropriate time to go back to the uh, statutory and regulatory requirements and maybe have them fulfill those requirements but not necessarily do the full report uh, to the commission in the same way that they've been doing it before. Notably though, this would just be a temporary break because we would go back once the casinos are reopened. So it may be helpful if just Joe would comment on the request from the, uh, from the uh, casinos and then Todd can just go through what those basic requirements are by statute and regulation so you're familiar. Does that make sense? Or any commissioners have any questions on that process? Okay, so Joe, are you there? Yeah, um, so you know, I called our licensees just to chat with them about this issue on sort of where things stand and all, and the, the gist of it was that, you know, our licensees were asking if they, if they didn't have to do any kind of a report, that would be great. But if they did have to do some kind of a report, they would certainly be happy to do whatever the commission requires them to do but they did request that they not have to make a uh, presentation in public on this a big PowerPoint and so on. And you know, the, the primary issue again was the uh, sort of lack of staff resources to do that. And the fact that a lot of the things that they would normally be reporting on 
obviously aren't happening right now. So I think you know that seems like a, a certainly a reasonable request on, on the part of the licensees, and um, I think you know with that, I'll turn it over to Todd about sort of what the legal requirements are. Unless any of the commissioners have questions for me about that. Well, th thanks, Joe, um, and just to to pick up there, we thought it would just be helpful in navigating this issue to have a, a broad overview of the legal requirements um, that pertain to the situation. Um, and so the notion of a quarterly financial report is first referenced in section five of chapter 23K, where it simply says, the commission shall promulgate regulations for the implementation, administration, and enforcement of chapter 23K without limitation regulations that require quarterly financial reports. Um, so it's, it's a fairly simple directive in the statute, um, which the commission of course followed and adopted regulations governing uh, quarterly reports. And in 205 CMR 139.06, the commission established the scope and content expected to be contained in a quarterly report filed by a gaming licensee. It's in those regulations that the process is really uh, driven. Uh, it's described there that the report can essentially be broken down into two parts. The first is a written report that provides a view of the gaming licensee's financial position and a narrative commentary on operating results. The second part of the quarterly report is by regulation expected to be a certification by the licensee's CFO um, as to the truth of four specific statements uh, that we make in the regulations relating uh, to essentially the licensee's financial posture. Um, these include things like the maintenance of an adequate gaming bankroll, the ability to pay taxes and fees imposed under both Chapter 23K and 205 CMR, the ability to make required capital expenditures to the gaming establishment consistent with the statute and regs and any uh, approved plan, um, and the ability to pay or otherwise manage uh, certain debts. Um, so those are the four statements that are made in the regulations that the CFO or other in similarly situated individual is expected to certify. Um, section 139.06 bears some conceptual similarity to a 10Q filing, which is required of public companies, uh, but applies the concept to the gaming licensee or the at the LLC level as opposed to the publicly traded corporate parent. Um, and so ultimately the commission does have some discretion as to the breadth of the submission. That's a, a broad overview of the, the statute and regs. Um, this may be a good place to pause um, for any uh, discussion or, or questions relative to the legal requirements or, or any others that have been mentioned. Are there any questions for Todd? Raise the hand. Anyone? Um, I, I do. I have, um, I guess my question is this. I, I understand that we would not want to impose a burden on our licensees around reporting. Um, if it's not, if that, the items on which they would be reporting are not critical to our current operations and analyses. If they are statutorily required through our and through our regulations required, I think that, and I think I'm, I haven't heard an exact recommendation on this, but I would defer that report to be made to us at a, at a reasonable time in the future so we don't have to do that now, but that we would want them to report. You know, in terms of the, whether it's a PowerPoint or how they report it, it doesn't matter to me at all but I would think that they would need to fulfill this report substantively in some way. Uh, but I want to make sure that whatever we do today somehow doesn't limit us on getting information that might be important to us now. And how that information is conveyed, again, I, I, I'm not worried about 
the presentation, I want to make sure we have we don't somehow um, inadvertently uh, signal that we don't need access to that information. Commissioner Zunica, you heard um, at least in terms of from uh, uh, Mr. Grossman, you you've heard what is required for the items under the regs. They fall very much under your uh, expertise. Uh, do you have a recommendation as to what you would like to be to receive for reports along the way without unnecessarily burdening our licensees? Yeah, uh, yeah thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I do. I think there's um, the ability for us to provide all, all kinds of relief in terms of what is usually submitted and presented, the PowerPoint, the vendor spend, uh, et cetera, that, that organically became part of the report because it was asked over the months and days and, uh, and then uh, of the public interest. That's not necessarily spelled out in regulation and that's fine for us to simply say, well, on the account of both the burden and the reality of suspension of operations, we can defer that, uh, you know, uh, uh, until we 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 feel. Um, I I do want to uh, just mention that um, what is spelled out in regulation um, occurs to me that is not necessarily burdensome. Uh, it's not something that we need uh, right away, but it's something that I think is interesting. It, it would be of interest uh, to us during this time or at least especially prior to or shortly after the reopening um, so it, it is some it's it's i, I imagine it is a, is a is a one or two pager uh, it has to be carefully considered by the cfo uh, as to uh, you know and, and it's something that i know they're considering you know quite often these days for for obvious reasons um, but it's something that I would like to us um, have them comply with. Again, it doesn't have to be the timing of it. It doesn't have to be at the beginning or the middle of the, or you know, the end of the quarter. Uh, I'm more interested in the reality of these certifications uh, relative to maintenance of the bankroll, the taxes and fees, the ability to, uh, to make or not, or defer capital expenditures. If they can not make those certifications, it would, in my mind, at least elicit a, an important discussion. Um, or if they can, then then it would have a really good, um, uh, it would meet uh, the purpose that we wanted from the beginning. So I would be in favor of, um, you know, having uh, furthering the conversation as to what the, the timing of this, uh, but uh, more, um, sticking to the point of the regulation to have them uh, comply with it, um, especially around um, as we get ready to reopen. I, I know that the, these uh, certifications um, must have been discussed at a certain time because they're in the regulation. So they must have been um, vetted and, and there must have been an opportunity for the licensees to comment, comment on them. So I'm anticipating that they will, won't be surprised by this request. I, I um, would recommend, and I don't think we have to have a vote on this, but something for the team to think about, you know, getting back to the licensees and saying, absolutely, we want to give you relief and, you know, we don't want to tax your, your bandwidth on uh, presentation or, or otherwise, but we do have these uh, particular uh, regs in place and they can fulfill that obligation at a time that makes sense and I would defer to the team and Commissioner Zuniga on what what the right team is what the right, right time is so that we're informed um, operationally if that makes sense yeah again it's 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 a conversation we should have uh, again we can address at a later time um, it is entirely possible. Um, I don't have first-hand knowledge as to um, whether they would or not, but that, that they might say uh, there's a caveat with one or any aspect of this certification. Again, something that we need to understand. That's right. Um, 
it doesn't mean that uh, you know we're gonna we're gonna penalize them for being right. out of compliance or anything like that. It is something that should informs us, and that's, that's right. the genesis uh, of, of the of the reporting requirement to begin with, and that's something that I think we should continue. I agree with that. Uh, uh, Karen, is that helpful feedback? Yeah. Sure. Yes, that, that's kind of exactly what we're looking for is it's just some kind of general guidance on to see if, if we're going in the right direction that uh, we don't need the, the large extravagant PowerPoint type of presentation, but we do still want the basic requirements in this, the regulation and leave us some flexibility if the commission wants any other information, particularly right now, we will still ask for it. So the commissioners you know, just want to communicate to all of you that if there's something in particular you're thinking as we're going through this process, some information you want, we can absolutely request that from the, from the licensees and we will provide that. So we have, a, we have a, a mechanism to get information, but as far as just the logistics of a, of a quarterly report, um, not requiring the same thing right now makes a lot of sense, but I wanted to make sure that the commission was on board with that before we communicated that back to the licensees. Madam, Madam Chair, I would add, um, I, I certainly echo Commissioner Zuniga's points and, and, and what is required, uh, both under our statute and regulation. Uh, you know, as we think about the quarterly report, you know, we would have been in a time right now of anticipating a report on January through March of this year. Well, that's a snapshot from the past. Um, you know, those those reports, I think that report would, uh, you know, offer little guidance on what the reopening of gaming is going to look like in Massachusetts. Um, I would suggest, though, to Karen and the team, because we've been having multiple conversations about some new reporting requirements and some new reporting formats that we continue to work on that um, and, and subscribe that in uh, as, as we can in quarterly reports going forward when our licensees reopen. Absolutely, that makes a lot of sense. And, and that was on Joe's plate anyway. So right, exactly. Stay tuned on that, so thank you. Uh, other commissioner questions on this matter? Uh, I don't really have a question so much as a comment um, that I conveyed in the briefing yesterday, which I agree with what was, what's been said by the other commissioners. Uh, and I also do think there should be some sort of public acknowledgement of the status of those filings. Yep. It can be done through Joe, through Joe and Commissioner Zuniga, but I do think that it should be continue to be part of what, what we publicly discuss. Okay. Even if it's pared down and even if it is not in the same format as uh, licensees coming in and presenting formally to us, I think public acknowledgement should continue. Yes, and we can and we can coordinate on that and you know do that in a way that the commissioners are all comfortable. That that sounds like a and, great plan. And always we can have a full public discourse on on these matters. I think we're just really trying to reduce the um, you know, what would be maybe a burden on them to, to prepare for presentation, but this doesn't in any way uh, limit our ability to, to uh, discuss, hash out, you know, in our, in our natural form. Right. Okay. Excellent. I, I had that concern too, Commissioner O'Brien, so thank you. Okay, so Any other questions? It actually was an excellent exercise uh, so that I could understand uh, the genesis of our quarterly reports, which I very much look forward to, uh, and, and now understand uh, going forward what we will want to expect on, on a, when things are fully resumed. Okay, that okay. concludes, if there are no further questions, uh, yeah. item number seven. So now we have um, the opportunity for our commissioner's updates and I will turn to each of you. Uh, Commissioner Cameron, do you have an update? I do as a matter of fact, thank you. Um, I just want to kind of officially report that um, we've been talking about hosting a joint conference with IAGR, the International Association of Gaming Regulators and IMGL, the International Masters of Gaming Law. Um, that has officially this week been postponed from September of 2020 
to September of 2021. And there's a team negotiating as we speak with the Marriott Copley to, um, to select new dates for, uh, that will work for September of 2021. So that work has been ongoing and uh, everyone, uh, uh, including our team, uh, was in agreement, and we have certainly a member, our interim executive director on the board, was in agreement that this was the proper step to take because of um, the crisis we're in. And uh, so that is now official and um, that will be occurring uh, a year later. Well, thank you for that update. It's a disappointment, but I do think it's really realistic and practical. Yes, yes. Thank you, Commissioner um, Commissioner Cameron, for your work. I know Janice Riley's been very instrumental on that matter. And then, of course, um, um, Ms. Wells, thank you for your representation on the board. Anything else, Gail? That's it. Thank you. All righty. Commissioner Zuniga, do you have an update? Not today. Not today, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner O'Brien, do you have an update? I don't have anything today, thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Stebbins? Uh, no update today, Madam Chair, thank you. Okay. Well, um, I think then that we've completed number eight and I um, wanna uh, thank, of course, Marion and uh, uh, Jamie for their work. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes that doesn't get credit in our public meetings, as you all appreciate, but um, when we're not there in person, it's hard to say thank you enough. Um, so to Marianne, uh, her, she is nimble. She is up looking at emails early. And Jamie, I don't know when she, I think she looks at her emails in her sleep. So it uh, keeps everything running smoothly. Thank you so much. I could thank everyone, but today it's Marianne and Jamie's spotlight. So thank you. Um, do we have any other business that I didn't anticipate? I don't think so. All right, thank you so much. I need a motion. I move to adjourn. Second. Second. Commissioner Stebbins got it. Uh, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. Commissioner votes yes. So chair votes yes. Thank you so much. And uh, everyone stay safe and thank you for joining our meeting today. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.